Welcome to GSBA's Rapid Response, giving you the opportunity to ask questions with live answers. Today's immediate feedback comes directly from Nicole Denamer of Sustainable Strategies. Our topic, supporting health and wellness while working from home. My name is Joey Chapman. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Membership Development Manager for GSBA and will be today's Rapid Response Moderator. Along with fellow GSBA staff tuning in, also joining me today is Terea Miller. Terea uses she, her, hers pronouns and is the GSBA Membership and Programs Manager. GSBA continues to follow Governor Inslee's Stay Home, Stay Healthy order, now extended through May 31st. Our staff members continue to practice physical distancing, working remotely while staying socially connected with our up-to-date GSBA COVID-19 emergency resource page, which now includes Washington State's reopening and recovery plan and the GSBA rapid response. So how will the rapid response work for you? Our format allows you to engage with a professional with questions in the wake of COVID-19. Today, we are streaming both on Zoom and Facebook Live. And throughout the hour, please feel free to use uh, the Q&A features to ask any questions. Treya and I will follow along and do our best to ensure that your questions get answers. So today, we would like to go ahead and welcome our very special guest, uh, Nicole Denamer. Welcome, Nicole. Hi, Joey. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, we are so happy to, to welcome you this, this morning. Um, why don't you just go ahead and take a moment and we'd like to invite you to address and, and introduce yourself to our, our viewers. Sounds great. Uh, like Joey said, my name is Nicole Denamer. Uh, a couple things that are relevant to the discussion here. Uh, I'm an attorney. I'm also a well AP, a lead green associate and an eco districts AP. So I kind of work in that sweet spot of risk management with health and wellness. And uh, a couple months ago after practicing law for about 14 years, I retired and decided to focus my work full time uh, in the sustainability and climate change space. And so I launched my uh, consulting practice called Sustainable Strategies and really work to help folks think through um, how their indoor spaces can benefit them because they generally don't. And I think a lot of people don't know that. So um, happy to support members here today. Uh, one thing I do need to kind of get out of the way for my own insurance purposes is that uh, this is kind of an educational and informational setting. I'm going to be answering questions, but not giving any type of legal or medical advice. I think the, the common sense part of that is that uh, you get information from a lot of different people and ultimately make the choice that's best for you best on, based on what you've learned. So with that out of the way, um, here to help folks who are working from home. I know people have kind of been forced into this transition of uh, spending a lot more time in a space than you probably ever anticipated and noticing a lot of different things about it. And because a lot of my work focuses on healthy or healthier buildings, um, I think folks could use a little support there. So we need to help people uh, understand the impacts that buildings have on, on their health and wellness because they are pretty dramatic. Well, we definitely thank you for bringing your knowledge. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks uh, who are tuning in today um, who will follow this along later on uh, with the recording um, will find it very informative. Um, we are split between Zoom and Facebook Live uh, with our folks attending uh, to view, uh, but we wanted to jump in to do some polling if we could uh, before we get our rapid response Q&A. Um, and it's something we'll be able to do with some of the guests that are here right now with us uh, currently on, on Zoom. Um, so let's go ahead and, and grab one of our first poll questions for the folks who are uh, currently participating on Zoom. All right, so you should be able to see that now. Uh, the first question is, have you struggled with your new work from home space? We're at 50-50, so definitely some oh, wow. folks are, are struggling. So I think today's, uh, today's uh, rapid response is very important. Let's jump to that next question. Has your employer given you a stipend or a budget to purchase home office equipment like a monitor or a new chair? See those results. 100% no. It's a very interesting question. We, we kind of talked about this before uh, we jumped live here today. Um, um, that it, it might be something that down the road, if this continues on, that um, employers should reflect on this with their budgets for, for the people that are working at home. Yeah, you know, I have seen some um, folks, uh, some employers doing this, giving you know, a couple hundred bucks to get a monitor, a nicer chair, 
a second a, a keyboard or something like that and um i think that's helpful and part of you know the themes that i'll talk about today is people advocating for themselves and their um how their health impacts their space and so if you do work for one of those larger employers maybe worth um asking that question if something like that is an option because it seems like at least for the folks who are here answering, um, that's not something that's been offered to them. And we are going to be in this state for another at least, you know, rest of this month, as you mentioned at the beginning, Joy. Sure. I, I hearken back to my father. I can hear him in my ear saying the greasy uh, or the, the, the wheel, greasy wheel gets the, you know, the greasy wheel, tie, sweetie wheel gets the grease. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's been a long time since I've heard him say that in my ear, but um, it's true, you know it's always good to ask. We do have one more polling question. Uh, let's go ahead and get that launched. Um, where are you most frequently working from? It's like most folks have, have a dedicated desk, um, I think, which is great, uh, but there's still wherever I can is, is definitely an option for, for, for individuals. I could speak for myself, you know, before um, having my own personal desk here at home. I didn't. I, had, I was working straight from the, the coffee table, so you had to make do. Yeah, and even having access to a dedicated desk uh, doesn't mean that there's not additional ways that that space can be improved and we can, we can talk about some of those things um, or that you should let the kind of question that we were just on whether or not employers are kind of supporting that work from home space go by the wayside there's still like I said opportunities to have perhaps better chair set up or a lot of ergon ergonomists which I am not <laughs> advocate for a separate, separate keyboard or you know monitors and things like that so uh, even having a dedicated desk uh, is great helps reduce the distractions, but there are still ways to potentially support your ability to work in an effective way um, within that space. And I totally get wherever I can or the, or the others of the world. I think people are just doing the best they can. Sure, sure. Well, thank you everybody who's viewing uh, that went ahead and did the poll questions for us. Uh, I think it was a great for us to be able to connect together this morning before we jumped right into um, our rapid response uh, Q&A portion of the hour. Um, Nicole, in Washington state, we are living under Governor Inslee's uh, stay home, stay healthy proclamation. Um, and as of today, uh, now in phase one towards uh, the reopening, um, how would you typically define the use of the word healthy and, and why is uh, a healthy indoor environment so vital? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's one that I, um, I often challenge people to think about because healthy is a very, uh, almost dangerous term. I talked to my students, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I teach and taught and developed a couple graduate level classes on sustainable health and wellness. And I challenge my students to think about terms like healthy and green. You can, the extreme example is that water is healthy, we need it to survive, but you can also drown in it, right? So that's a very extreme example, but for purposes of making the point. And so when we use terms like healthy, they can mean so many different things. And they're also such personal terms. So I think it's important that when we're using a term like healthy, it has kind of different contexts um, in the context of the pandemic. So kind of putting that aside for a second, but healthy is so personal and we put so many expectations and experiences and assumptions on it. You know, healthy to me probably doesn't mean the same thing as healthy to you, Joey, or healthy to someone who's watching because it's, just a, it's such a personal term. And so, I think it's really important when we're using terms like this to either be mindful. I prefer using terms like healthier. I have a colleague who always challenges the er, things are greener, uh, they're healthier as opposed to healthy because that sounds very definite. But I always challenge myself to think through healthy when we use terms like that. There's implications with respect to marketing, which I can talk about in a minute. Um, but it's so personal. And the example that I give, Joey, I know you went through one of our, our free courses, which I can talk about a little bit more, but the example I give there is that we see, if you go to the grocery store, you can probably pay, you know, six to eight bucks for a green juice that is um, marketed as healthy, but that could not be healthy for certain people, you know, if that, if your dietary needs dictate that you need additional, you know, vitamins and vegetable sources, great. A lot of these green juices also have a lot of uh, sugar, carbohydrates, things like that, that may not be great for everyone. So calling something healthy, I think is something we need to just pause on and, and think through uh, in the con and in the context of buildings specifically, uh, because everybody's needs are different. And healthy is also a temporal context. I talk to my students about this a lot. You could experience uh, 
health one way, you know, today and health one way, for example, if you got sick uh, in a different day, you know, drawing on my own personal experience to me, a large part of my health, I'm very privileged that I can run and that's a part of my health and wellness, uh, health for my physical health and also wellness for my mental health because I work out, you know, problems and, and anxiety and all kinds of different things when I run and stress. And so when I can run, I feel very healthy to me personally. Right now, I, I did something to my knee and I can't run. So I feel a little unhealthy these days because that's something that I can't do. So these, these personal aspects of terms like health and healthy, um, I think it's something we need to be mindful of when, when we use them. Um, when we buy products that say that they're healthy, that's something I could you know spend a whole other hour on. And, and then also with respect to building. So kind of coming full circle on your question, I think your average person doesn't realize just how much your physical space influences your health in many different ways. And that is being highlighted now in the context of the current pandemic. That has always been true. Um, I think it's just becoming more part of our common language now. And people are really recognizing how things like indoor air quality um, and cleanliness of surfaces and different things um, really impact not just health, but as we were talking about earlier, uh, wellness and mental health and all those kinds of different things. So that was kind of a long answer to your question, but I think the, the point about defining it like healthy is that it's important to do that and to think through what that term means. And also if you don't, someone else will define it for you. And like I said, a big theme for me here in a lot of my work is advocating for your own health and wellness. Uh, I do that through physical spaces, so, uh, other people's work focuses on different things. But uh, understanding and defining that term for yourself and advocating for your own health and wellness, uh, I think is super important and something that people maybe don't feel as empowered as they, as they could or should be uh, to do, but it's, it's super important. It was a long answer. <laughs> no, it's, it's great. Everyone has their own personal definition or, or perspective on what health is you know, yeah. in their life, um, physical, mental, and just even in their physical yeah. space uh, as well. Um, do you have a question? Could you talk a little bit more about uh, well building standard? Yeah, so so that, that gets to what we were just talking about, right? So if concepts like green uh, and, and healthy are really hard to define because they mean so many different things. So one way that we help define those terms is by using a standard or a framework to do that. Uh, because, you know, if we if we take green buildings, for example, which is where a lot of my work focuses, a uh, green building to someone might mean something different to me who's a practitioner who works in that every day and understands the technical aspects of green building. Same thing with healthy. It's hard to describe the HVAC system and the flooring products and the chemicals that are used to clean a building in a way that doesn't take a nerd like me 45 minutes to go through. You need a shorthand uh, to describe healthy or healthier spaces. And so we use framework in um, kind of the health and wellness. Health and wellness is really collapsed in the sustainability and, and, and that's a appropriate for a bunch of reasons I can talk about that. So that's why I keep drawing so many parallels to those two things. But um, the well-building standard is one way that we create a framework and kind of a common language around how we define healthier spaces. We've seen these types of certifications and frameworks in uh, the sustainable building context for years. You probably work or there's if you're in seattle there's a high potential that you work in a lead certified building or you know someone who does or maybe you live in a lead certified building so that has kind of translated to uh the well building standard which is another um, building certification system it's not a competitor to lead it's kind of a they work together in a lot of respects um, but it's a way to, to to boil those complicated concepts down and to create a common language that was, that was a big introduction. So specifically lead, or excuse me, well is, uh, so I'm a well AP, so I have the accredited professional designation that's associated with that standard. There are also other standards. There's fit well, there's other kind of, there's other things out there, I guess, but I know, I know the most about well given my accredited professional. So, so what well does is it kind of creates this common language by breaking health and wellness in the, in the physical space down to what they call 10 concepts. And I always have to write them down because I forget them. So this goes to my whole point about how do we define healthy. This particular framework breaks it down into 10 concepts and, and these will all kind of make sense. So air, water, nourishment, light, movement, 
thermal comfort if you've ever worked in a freezing office space like I have. <laughs> uh, sound, right, materials, mind, and community. So that so the well standard in particular breaks down health and wellness into those ten what they call concepts, and then within those ten concepts are various features that are are tied to specific health intents. So for example, air you could say underneath that concept are features related to filtration, ventilation, um, and other things like that. And then you can kind of pick those concepts to get to a specific certification level. It's a little technical after that, but um, it's kind of, I think about certification systems because I work under a lot of them. I think I'm, I'm an accredited professional with three of them now um, as ways to create a framework to ensure that we don't have gaps. A lot of times we overlook things. So things that I appreciate about like well is that they incorporate things like community, social justice issues, a lot of these important things that we need to make sure are embedded within our frameworks. Um, and so it's a, it's a good way to make sure that we don't have gaps and that we can talk about kind of these concepts in a, in a way that makes sense. Um, and then there's a lot of technical aspects to all of these certification systems. Um, so you have professionals who come out and verify buildings. One of the nice things about well and um, some of the newer certification systems and this is a, a trend among health and wellness that is totally appropriate is we're kind of moving away from this moment in time, this building is the way that it should be to a really performance-based standard. So how is, not just how is the building designed, what do we put in it, but how does it actually perform over time? And how are the humans who are in that space, are we getting the health outcomes that we really want out of them um, from being in that space? That's usually through surveys and things like that. Um, but I think that that shift is is important as well when we're looking at healthy buildings and healthier buildings and what does that look like. So that was a super high level of the, the well building standard. The nice thing about it is, well, there's, there's two things I'd highlight, is that it's free. Everyone who's watching now can go online. Uh, I think it's wellcertified.org. If you Google well building standard, you can go in and access the standard, which is basically, um, like I said, those 10 concepts, and then all of the research that supports why those concepts really facilitate the health outcomes that they're designed to. So I use it as a practitioner as ways to, you know, if I need a, a source or a site for something, um, it's free. And so everyone can go there and, and, and look at it. And then the, the second reason, which I kind of merged into the first, is that it nicely organizes all the research that there is. So if you're trying to explain uh, to a boss or a colleague why natural daylight is important or where you should look for tools on ergonomics, uh, you can go to these standards and actually kind of find the research right there. And so um, the standard is available for free. Being certified uh, has fees associated with it. That's a different thing, but um, they've made it accessible to everyone. I think that's super important. So. This that was is another really long answer. No, it's perfect. <laughs> it's great structure, kind of gives a background and a focus direction that we're going to move forward with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for the rest of our hour. You know, now that many of us um, have made that transition to working uh, from home, there, there's notably a lot more that goes into setting up your homework uh, environment. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and jump into yeah. some basic high-level strategies uh, when it comes to obtaining a, a healthy uh, indoor environment. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody that's, that's watching today on uh, Zoom or Facebook Live, uh, we do have the Q&A box open and available. So if one of the, the topics that we uh, touch upon here um, strikes up a question, um, please do go ahead and, and type that into the Q&A chat or the comment section. Terea is there to go ahead and follow along and we'll make sure uh, we get your, your questions asked. Um, Nicole, let's go ahead and, and touch base uh, on indoor air quality. Um, does, does indoor air quality really matter? Does it make a difference uh, or is it just a nice thing to have? Yeah, yeah no, that's a, that's a great question. And I think a lot of people who do, do my work um, and probably a lot of people who've worked in office buildings, you'll say, I, I know that I feel better when I am not in a stuffy conference room, when it doesn't smell like new car smell, which by the way is cancer, but that's a different story. Uh, when, you know, when the temperature is the way that it should be, um, and I, I can feel when the air is irritating, people will, you know, people will commonly have these types of complaints, but they don't actually know that it's coming from the air. So it's something that I think people really recognize once they pay attention to it. Um, and so we, we knew these things for a long time, and now we actually have the data to support that there are 
real productivity uh, impacts to poor air quality. And the flip side of that is there are real productivity uh, drivers who have better uh, air quality. And you know, even taking a step back from that, I, I wrote down this fact this morning, the World Health Organization says that air pollution is the number one cause of premature deaths. And so, you know, we're talking about air pollution, which is a bigger kind of global thing, but if you think about uh, there is indoor air pollution and it is prevalent. And, you know, we're also going to see this shift, unfortunately, because of climate change, of people going indoors as a place of refuge. So I think that's uh, another way or reason or driver to think through the importance of indoor air quality. So that's a little bit of background, but yes, indoor air quality definitely matters. And there was a study that just came out. So a lot of the work that's being done on healthier buildings is coming from Harvard School of Public Health. There's a researcher there, his name's Joe Allen, and I'd encourage you to Google him and his work. You may have seen that he's been very busy lately because his um, he's an exposure scientist basically with respect to buildings. So he is the person to talk about how to mitigate the impacts of the current pandemic in building spaces, but he and his colleagues actually serendipitously a couple of years ago came out with a study that assessed the uh, the cognitive impacts of one common indoor air pollutant, and that's volatile organic compounds. So without getting too nerdy, uh, VOCs, you may have heard someone say you may have bought low VOC paint or heard a commercial for low VOC paint. Um, VOCs are a common indoor air pollutant. It's a series of chemicals that uh, off gases from liquids and solids in certain temperatures and things. And it is that new car smell is what people often think of. Something has a smell to it, chances are it's not good. <laughs> Just say that. Oh, no. um, and yeah, be aware of smells. Um, you know, even fragrances, if it's, uh, anyway, that's, that's a whole different story, but yeah. Well, anyway, so, the, so the point is that, sure. oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, it, you know, is there something that we can uh, actually do to improve our air quality within our, our apartments or our condos that we're currently, you know, residing in and working at the same time? Yes, totally. So, so the, the biggest way to kind of reduce those VOCs and to uh, improve supporting inter better air quality is to open up the windows. Um, you know, clearing ventilation, I think, is is kind of the best strategy. Now, obviously this is context-based. So if you are, for example, have a problem with pollen right now in Seattle, that, that may be something you wanna be mindful of how often you do that. But when you open up windows, what you're doing is you're diluting the air in that space. So any, any pollution, anything that's in there, any VOCs uh, or other things like that, that are in the air, you're, you're helping to dilute them by, by providing fresh air. So if you live in a, I live in an apartment building, there's windows on one side, you might want to utilize something like fans to help pull air in and push it out um, because you don't have things like um, mechanical HVAC systems like you did in your office building. Those present different challenges, which we don't need to get into, but just opening up your windows and letting fresh air in, obviously keeping those contexts of pollution and asthma and things like that in mind is, is kind of the number one strategy. If you want to take it a, a step further, there are some personal air purifiers that that people can get, um, you know, on Amazon and other places. Um, that's definitely taking it, it a step further and that has costs associated with it. But the kind of freebie is just opening up your windows. And uh, similarly, something that people don't often think about that I think is super important is running bathroom fans. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, it kind of gets to the ick factor of sustainable buildings that I won't get into too much. But um, the number of bad things that can be put in the air for up to 30 minutes by flushing of a toilet are not good. And so just turning on bathroom fans, flushing toilet lids, uh, particularly if you live in a small space like I do, or if you live in some of the even smaller apartments that I have in the past, um, you know, is uh, a good way to just kind of keep some of that bacteria down. So I encourage people to close toilet lids, run bathroom fans for like 30 minutes or so, obviously being mindful of energy usage. And uh, there are there's easy ways that you can improve the indoor air quality. And like I said, we have proven cognitive benefits, not just health benefits, but your ability to focus and all kinds of different things uh, from taking a look at air quality. So if you're going to look at one thing, that's the one thing that I would look at first. Well, I've definitely taken that advice when oh, I was doing some research on you. I, I've utilized that bathroom fan uh, as much as possible and keeping the window open, uh, you know, definitely circulate the, the air within uh, my new working environment to myself. Um, I want to yeah. touch base on, on management of dust. You know, we are in our 
our homes yeah. um, and, and you know there's dust and, and dirt that uh, accumulates you know surprisingly just by having the window open um, I wake up in the morning and I sweep the floor every day and I'm shocked to see what what is there do you have um, suggestions about or strategies for managing dust yeah totally and that's another one that's often overlooked and um, you know, I've lived across the street, you know, having lived on Capitol Hill and South Lake Union and all over myself, um, I've had the same experience where I leave the windows open overnight and there is black or brown kind of soot on the windowsill. That's what's coming in from the outside. And so we're looking at kind of competing interests, right? Because I just said, open the windows to clean the air. We're also recognizing that there are things that come in from the outside, including dust and all sorts of other things. And so being mindful of, of those sources and just kind of balancing these competing factors is important. So um, dust gets to indoor air quality because that is an indoor air pollutant, right? And so one of, to your point about strategies, I think something that's often overlooked, and if you're at home, now is the perfect time to do this, clean your vacuum filter. People forget to do this. I forget to do this. If you don't know how, almost every vacuum manufacturer has online, you know, you Google your brand and your type and it should tell you what you either need to buy or how to clean it um, at home or whatever the case may be. So follow the manufacturer's instructions and just clean it out because you could be actually putting more dust in the air if your vacuum is clogged. So, so that's step one. And then step two, I like to direct people to kind of look at some of the often overlooked places like actually vacuum your mattress vacuum under your mattress oh. um, kind of look at all these spaces that you don't often think about because that's where dust really collects and then when you are opening those windows and creating airflow you're just going to kick it all up or if you have animals like i do they tend to get in everything and they are also a source of dust and allergens and so making sure that you kind of manage their bedding and things like that is another strategy but um i think kind of the Keeping in mind that dust is not just something that you clean because it looks gross or weird, but it's also going towards your health and wellness is the important point to keep in mind. It is improving your indoor air quality, is improving your indoor space, and it, otherwise you leave that in there and it's, it's an eye irritant, it can uh, trigger asthma and all kinds of other things. And so if you're not motivated to dust uh, on its own, think through how it is impacting your space that you are now spending a ton of time in. So. I kind of use that framework to help people as well. In continuing the conversation uh, with cleaning, um, you know, yeah. pretty prevalent, uh, relevant um, topic at hand has been household cleaning items um, and what you should and should not be doing with them. Um, do you, uh, what do you recommend when it comes to, you know, cleaning items and what we sh should be looking out for? Yeah, and so that's, that's a great question. And, this is all obviously contextual, right? So with respect to the pandemic and the virus, follow CDC guidelines and all of those types of things. So it, put that aside. And now in the kind of normal, un, not pandemic context, what we want to be aware of is the fact that a lot of cleaning items can contain toxins or irritants or fragrances, which can be both of those things. And so uh, there's and dyes. I'm trying to think of an easy way to explain this. Um, you know, we're used to seeing Windex as blue. That's a dye that's in there. We're used to certain things smelling a certain way. That's a chemical that's been added to the product to make it smell a certain way that's potentially also an irritant. So cleaners are a common kind of what I'd call a hiding space for a lot of other irritants. And they also contain a lot of things that aren't really necessary to get the job done. That's why you'll see a lot of blogs talking about you know your own make at home cleaners that involve things like vinegar uh, baking soda water those work generally just as well and can save you a lot of money uh, it, once again in a normal context outside of the ne necessity to kind of bleach and do things like that um, but so keeping in mind that cleaners can be a source of irritation and then when you spray them in your space that you're spending a lot of time in you're aerating them and you're putting you're reducing your indoor air quality again so I think being really mindful of what you're using on surfaces and, and what potential unintended consequences a cleaner could have um, is something that's important. So, so how do you do that, right? I think there's two things to be mindful of. And I wrote this down too, because I forget it, but there are um, a couple resources to look, you know, I can't remember everything, particularly now. Uh, there's a couple things, couple resources, and we can put these out there if they're easier, but the EPA actually still has some 
uh, good resources on green cleaning products. So if you Google like EPA uh, green cleaning products, they do kind of some vetting or at least some information more than we could give here about what's good and bad. Um, that website is actually still pretty good. Even under this administration, it hasn't been sanitized. Um, I guess there's a, there's a pun there, but a lot of EPA websites have. Um, the other two sources are the Environmental Working Group has some um, resources with respect to cleaners. You can kind of sort, you can actually put in the name of your product and it will tell you kind of some of the common irritants. Same thing for the Consumer Product Information Database. Um, so you can, there are various tools. I'm just listing a couple um, that you can use to kind of see what's in a product. And once again, this goes to the whole theme of advocate for yourself. If a manufacturer is not disclosing what's in a particular product or you're not sure, ask, you know, it can't hurt. And people are leveraging the power of social media right now uh, to say, you know, is this what's in here? And should I know about it? And this, and this is potentially problematic. And I think that's uh, important with respect to cleaners. The other thing I would say is that there is some greenwashing with respect to some of the greener, greener cleaners. And so if you're not familiar with the term greenwashing, what that is, is when manufacturers kind of uh, overstate or exaggerate or unfortunately sometimes misrepresent the green, I hate this term, but I have to use it, the green attributes of, uh, of a product. So you could, I'm sure if you looked under your sink or in your bathroom, you would find something that's like eco-friendly or earth, whatever, or green, blah. Um, a lot of times those products are legitimately greener or healthier. Sometimes they're not, unfortunately. And so being mindful if you're paying what we call a green premium, sometimes greener products are more expensive. Um, not always, sometimes. Uh, knowing what's in those products and what makes them greener, and if they really are greener, is important. So just if you have two, like, you know, the example I give is two spray cleaner bottles. One is just your standard bottle, and one has a little leaf symbol on it, and is let's say, 10 cents more. You're like, oh, that's greener. I'm going to buy that understand what you're buying and, and, and make sure that it's actually greener because we see a lot of uh, misrepresentation with respect to consumers. I just did a talk uh, about this at Seattle U. My alma mater had a, a uh, Earth Day kind of celebration where I did a whole presentation on greenwashing and we have some other courses on that. So um, that was again a really long answer, but uh, kind of two things to be in my, mindful of I think are, well, one, you can make a lot of these cleaners at home. You can Google it and find ways to do that. The second is that you there are resources out there, the EPA, Environmental Working Group, Consumer Product Information Database, there are others where you can figure out what's actually in your cleaners and what some of the common uh, irritants are, keeping in mind that that's an indoor pollutant that you're bringing in your space. And then third, really understanding you know, what makes a product greener, particularly if you're gonna pay more for it, um, and asking questions, advocate for yourself, uh, advocate for what you're buying and bringing into your space, you have a right to know, so that was really long. <laughs> Not to worry, not to worry. It's very important, you know, question for people to think about too. You know, we are living and working in the same space. So if you're dealing with yep. chemicals, you want to make sure that um, you're, you're playing the game smart. Um, yep. looks, a, a quick question just came in. Uh, rather than buying branded products, uh, what common household products can I use to clean my house? So you, you kind of touched base a little bit on like the greenwashing or do you have any specific recommendations? Organic? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, and I, I couldn't off the top of my head kind of spit out what you can use specifically, but there's various mixes of, like I said, vinegar, water, um, and, and baking soda are kind of the common ones um, that you can find to, to use even as a basic surface cleaner, bathroom cleaners and stuff like that. Um, I, so, so there's kind of the homemade ones. Uh, unfortunately, we just have this person Google that and try to figure it out. Uh, the the other brand the brand that I use quite frankly uh, there's I don't get any endorsements for this I find I find that seventh generation stuff is pretty good um, so I personally use some of those but uh, some of the better grocery stores as well will help you choose items like the PCC in my neighborhood here um, they have their own kind of vetting protocol so um, if you're looking for specific products you can um, also kind of um, get more information, I guess, from some of those sources. That helps. So we mentioned a little bit about bleach. I mean, is, is it okay to use it somewhat or do you want to try to avoid bleach as much as possible? 
<laughs> I mean, it's all contextual, right? And so, you know, once again, out, outside the context of a pandemic, because there are reasons why we do need to use bleach in, in, in this context. So outside of that, you know, I personally can't think of a lot of reasons why we need to use bleach in a residential context. Um, and it's a pretty strong chemical. Um, but once again, the, there may be a specific context with a bacteria or issue that you do need to use it. Uh, personally, I don't have bleep in my house and I try not to. It's also because I have pets. Um, you know, a lot of these things animals can get into and kiddos as well. And so if, the way that I think about it, maybe this helps people is, what do I really need this for? And is it going to serve that purpose? If you really need bleach and you're gonna bring bleach in your house, I would go through the thought of what am I gonna use this for? And also buy as much as you need. You know, bleach is sold in these like handle type things that are like this big. If you're ever gonna use that much, wow. Um, you know, it's really designed for the commercial context. So um, I think maybe the, the unfortunately long answer to that question is, just a sense of being more mindful about the chemicals that we buy and making sure that they're necessary. There could be a context where maybe you've got an, a little kiddo and there's a lot of a, quite frankly, a poop issue and you've got to deal with it a certain way and, or your doctor has suggested that you do that because of potential viral transmission, then buy the size that you need. Don't buy the handle thing that you're going to have forever around your house and have to dispose of properly at some point. So I think maybe the the long and short answer is just being a bit more mindful about the things that we that we buy. A lot of times I encourage people to, you know, what we don't want to do is if you have a bunch of chemicals in your house right now, but you know, dump them down the drain, that's a terrible idea. But what you do is you kind of use up what you have, you find out how to dispose of those chemicals properly if you're not going to use them, and then make a more informed purchasing decisions going forward. I think it's not it's not consumers' fault that they haven't been provided a lot of information on the negative health impacts of these products. Um, so, so that gets to this whole advocacy piece, right? Understanding why is bleach actually so bad. Um, if you have to wear gloves and eye protection to use something, I think twice about bringing it into my home. Like, that's me. It's a good recommendation. Um, <laughs> Toria, it looks like we may have had a question uh, in the Q&A box. I wanted to toss it over to you. Yes, what room do you recommend working in as best option in a one bedroom apartment? Yeah, I've lived in uh, many small apartments myself. I used to joke that my shoebox in South Lake Union, I could literally uh, get something out of the fridge while still laying in bed. So um, I know what that feels like. Um, you know, I think it's less a matter of room and more a matter of where can you get the other aspects that are important um, and to best serve your health and wellness and productivity within that space. So what's, what I mean by that is we want to kind of support access to natural daylighting and views if possible. And then also, you know, if you're in a one bedroom, the question is, are you by yourself or not? Do you need quiet? Do you need headphones? Things like that. I always encourage people to get access to natural daylighting. The health benefits are now pretty well established. Um, not just the light, the vitamin D, particularly for us living here in Seattle, um, but also there are studies that show that actually viewing nature has so many stress reduction, anxiety reduction, and mental health supports and actually helps people heal better from surgeries. There's, there's all kinds of data out there now. So I would kind of reframe that question as to where can you set up your your desk or your workspace within that space to try to get access to natural daylighting. Chances are if you're doing that, you're also close to a ventilation source. So you're kind of getting these two supporting um, aspects of natural ventilation, natural daylighting, um, and kind of think through where can you do those things within your space. Obviously also being mindful of things like glare, uh, you know, if you have a big open window, but no opportunity to actually kind of mask the glare, that's problematic. So you just kind of have to situate yourself where it makes sense. You know, me personally, I'm now kind of working in a weird spot where I moved my desk into the living room so that I could be closer to natural daylighting. It works for me um, because I don't have any other noise impacts or things like that. But it's a, it's a matter of doing what's best for you. And I would just encourage you to keep in mind, like I said, try to get close to daylighting. Um, and, and views of nature because the health benefits there are, are really well established. So it's a great question. 
That's a, a wonderful transition so it's for, for natural lighting. Um, so it, it actually does make a difference and, and you should take full advantage of it as much as possible, I'm assuming. Yeah, there's, um, it's one of those things where you've probably intrinsically known this, right? It's like the cold conference rooms. You know that you can't work as well in a freezing cold office if you've ever experienced this, I have, because it's annoying and irritating and you can't focus. And similarly, you've probably noticed that you work better when and feel, probably more importantly, feel better when you have access to natural data lighting versus being in a closed off room. There's a study that, again, you can reference the well-building standard for all the research. Um, I pulled this from there. There's a study that's pretty often cited where they took, I believe it was heart, um, it was patients who were having some type of heart surgery and they had a set of patients who were in rooms that faced a brick wall and they had a set of patients that were in rooms with uh, access to natural daylighting and views. And the folks in the views and natural daylighting rooms healed almost a day sooner than the other folks. That's an eternity in medicine, right? And so, wow. <laughs> um, the, yeah, there are studies out there now. And it's one of those things where, um, you know, another thing I often challenge people with is you probably, you walk into a, a commercial office space, retail, a store or something, and there's like, let's say a countertop that's, that's natural wood. And it's really beautiful. You probably felt better when you saw that. You probably liked that space, but you couldn't put your finger on why it was. There's, now data that supports that it, this is part of biophilic design that we as humans are drawn to natural elements we feel better um, and to the point where there's actually a study that talks through um, you know obviously having view I keep pointing at a window over here that you can't see that's why it's probably weird but um, there's a, if you have views of the outdoors that's great but even pictures of natural views can help people feel better if you don't have um, that access so our human connection to nature is incredibly strong and that goes to access to views and daylighting and we now have kind of the science to back up a lot of those things that you probably intrinsically felt um, are actually improving your health and wellness uh, and don't cost a lot you know go for a walk sit next to a window stare at the trees uh, or it'll actually perhaps make a difference. work from outside you know, i'm assuming you know folks that have the opportunity to work from their yard um, it might be a little a, a healthier option perhaps if um, than indoors yeah, absolutely. And just taking that moment to switch spaces. Um, you know, I was, I've been like a lot of folks reading all the articles out there. And, you know, if you worked in a traditional office space, you actually moved spaces a lot more than you do now if you're working from home, right? Like you got up to go to a coffee machine, you probably got a snack, you probably met with colleagues, you moved to go to a meeting, you moved to come back. You know, when we're working from home, what we're doing is we're staying in one spot and we're taking Zoom calls all day, or it's a lot of people's reality, it's not everyone's reality. But so that sedentary uh, nature, I guess, is um, predicated and reinforced by this work from home situation. So Joey, to your example, you know, if you can say, okay, I'm gonna get this done and then I'm gonna go work outside for 30 minutes on something and then I'm gonna come back, you're actually mimicking, you're doing two good things. One, you're kind of restoring that um, sense of normalcy that you had when you worked in a traditional office environment and you're also getting up and moving and we're seeing people being a lot more sedentary uh, when working from home than you were in an office space you walked a lot more around an office than you probably realized and so that's a, a oh great it's noticeable enjoy. it's noticeable right now. yeah <laughs> yeah unfortunately yeah yes. so perfect perfect get outside yeah. as much as you can of course um doing it safely take uh, breaks yeah. yeah walk outside take breaks obviously do safely yeah wear masks and all the things the cdc is recommending um but just taking those opportunity to take breaks uh is important because it's getting us outside again safely with masks on um and, and the six feet and all that but um it's it's humans are habitual creatures and you're going back to what you used to do and so your body will respond with a like oh, okay i took breaks and i walked to meetings and i did this and i you know whatever and so it actually is helping people kind of um feel a little bit more grounded, even though we're in a really different space. Let's go ahead and toss it back uh, to Terea. I think there was an additional question from our Q&A box. Yeah, you were talking about taking breaks. How often should one take breaks during the day from their desk? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I hate to give a general answer, but I think you have to figure out what works best for you. That's, that's really it. Um, you know, I've seen a variety of research kind of the flip side of that is how long should you do focused work um, that goes from like 
you should set a timer for 20 minutes to you should set a timer for 90 minutes. Uh, I, and I think this goes to what I said at the beginning is you ultimately have to figure out what works, try different things and figure out what works best for you. Um, you know, everybody is unique and some people 20 minutes could be too short. Some people probably can't find 90 minutes if they're also balancing childcare. So I think you also have to kind of think through what works for me, try different things. You know, me personally, I've tried the timers. I've tried the, I'm going to finish this task and then I'm going to take a break. I've tried the, I'm going to, you know, to your point earlier, Joey, I'm going to, I'm going to work on this and then I'm going to give myself a treat and I'm going to go work outside for 20 minutes and then I'm going to come back. It, it's also personal, like again, the healthy aspects that, um, you really have to try things and decide for yourself. I apologize that that's a generic answer, but I think that's the best answer. Um, and at least making sure that you are taking breaks. So what we're seeing is a lot of people not taking breaks and not turning off at the end of the day. I'm super guilty of this myself, but you know, because we don't have that transition from, for, for folks who commuted, right? You don't have that, well, I'm done at five or six or seven, whatever it is, and then I'm gonna transition, take, the bus or drive or walk or bike, or whatever home, we don't have that end time anymore. And that is really um, forcing people to stay online and, and on all the time. And that is uh, problematic as well. It's a, it's a really high drain on our mental health. And so being aware of not just taking those breaks, but also cutting off at the end of the day, um, to the extent that you can, realizing that everybody's circumstance is different. Um, that's at least something to be a bit mindful of as well. Uh, this is interesting transition. A, a question just came in about um, plants in your uh, your new workspace um, and the difference between air quality and mood with those. So, so I'm curious if we can transition a little bit into uh, the biophilic design here. Yeah, biophilic design is really cool. And if you've never checked it out, I'd encourage people to just even Google biophilic design. Um, there's a couple good resources for it, but it is basically the once again, it's one of those intrinsic things that you've always probably felt better if you are a garden, if you've watered a plant. There are studies that show that actually kind of smelling how dirt smells uh, reduces people's stress and anxiety. And so um, biophilic design really captures all these different aspects and it can move even further into how we actually design buildings to um, do things like minimize wind drag and things like that. Um, so biophilic design is a really broad discipline and it's really interesting. It's basically stealing ideas from nature. And then um, uh, that's more biomimicry, but biophilic design is our, um, our natural affinity for, or our, I use nature too many times, but our affinity for nature. Once again, it's that idea that you feel better when you garden, you probably don't know why. You feel better when you water plants, you are drawn to a, a lobby that has a wooden desktop. Um, and those types of things. So it actually makes a difference. I think once again, the, I already talked about the, the best study, but it shows those, that those hospital patients actually recovered significantly faster because they were seeing uh, trees outside. And um, there's some interesting tweaks to that. I can't take the actual one, but it's in the well building standard where they talk about the spaces have to be well maintained. If you walk into a poorly maintained park, we are so drawn to and feel so personal about nature that if you see something poorly maintained, it actually brings us down. So <laughs> you want to be in those like really well-maintained spaces because we feel, so, we feel this really strong connection. Um, and so it, it actually makes a difference. And I always encourage people to just put a little plant on their desk, a little succulent or anything that works um, to have that little piece of greenery it really makes a difference. It's one of those things where in the past, I would have been the first person to be like, that doesn't make a difference, but it actually does. And um, it's one of those relatively inexpensive things that you can do to just um, help a little bit, particularly if like the person who asked the question about where should they sit in their small apartment, if you don't have a window that you can get your desk in front of, or if you don't have the ability just because of the way it's laid out, um, if you can position your desk in such a way that it is unfortunately facing a wall, that's all you can do. Put some plants on there and that will help get a similar positive impact um, from that biophilic design. So yeah, if you've never checked out biophilic design, I totally encourage people to Google it. It's, it's really fascinating. It's one of those, um, it validates a lot of the things that you probably already feel. I was thinking about this morning, it's time to, uh, to pull out the good old 1990s desk water fountain <laughs> waterfall so you get that trickling right. sound you know i'm sure that totally. will help with all want to connect with all senses uh for that um wanted to circle around uh about 
you know, your well-being, which is kind of what we've been talking a lot about today. Um, you know, your digital well-being, yep. as long as, you know, ergonomics. Um, we did have a question that kind of built, goes along uh, these lines uh, for one of our Q&A uh, friends here. So I'm going to have Treya go ahead and ask that question for you. Yeah, Nicole, how would someone hold themselves accountable to get up every morning uh, when you're working in from home and it's new to you? And um, finding employment from home that fits with the skills and interests. Yeah, I can probably uh, talk at least a little bit to the first one. Um, I'm not a, as much of an employment person, um, but I think a resource that I share with a lot of people, including my students and other people in my community, um, there's an author that I really like, and her name is Mel Robbins, and I don't know if people have ever checked her out as far as getting up in the morning. Um, she developed this thing called the five second rule, which is basically the idea, I do some work in uh, the psychology of sustainable behavior, why people do or do not engage in sustainable behavior. Mel Robbins' work focuses on productivity and kind of the psychology of that. And so I'd encourage that person to Google her. She also has a lot of free resources and you can see her TED talk that started this whole five second rule thing, which is the idea that has now been supported by neuroscience, which is that if you have uh, an idea to do something, or if you tell your brain, for example, I, I need to get up when my alarm goes off. Uh, if you don't move towards that goal within five seconds, your brain will kill it. And so Mel Robbins tools, the five second rule is that, and she was a chronic, uh, admits to being a chronic snooze button pusher, was that um, if you like, okay, the alarm goes off five, four, three, two, one, I have to move before I get to one, and then you'll actually do it. It's kind of this uh, neuroscience trick. And uh, I, I always encourage my friends and family and everybody I run into to look at her work. Uh, I've read a lot of her books, and I just find her to be a really super helpful resource. And she's put out a lot of stuff about uh, anxiety during the pandemic and stress. And so um, I'd encourage that person to, to check her out. And a whole bunch of her stuff is free as well. So that, that's a double, double bonus. So we all have a lot of additional time on our hands uh, besides just working uh, from home. Um, so I'm sure folks are cleaning out drawers, cleaning out cupboards, um, closet space uh, is being gone through. Uh, I wanted yeah. to touch base on, on some things like if you find electronics that might have some uh, toxicity to them or, or disposing of, of other things like broken down sofas or, or clothing um, and looking for ways to do it you know, ecologically. Um, do you have any uh, yep. suggestions for that? Totally. And, you know, one of the things that makes my environmentalist heart hurt really bad is when people throw away hazardous things into landfills. You know, it's unfortunate that we create as much waste as we do as it is. Um, but what's really difficult is when we don't dispose of things properly. This kind of gets to your um, question or point earlier about, about bleach and what I was saying about the big bottles is being mindful of what we buy, what, what we're really going to consume, because that is really what we're going to waste at some point. Every product has, uh, well, some products have a full life cycle, but most products um, are, are, we dispose of at some point. So anyway, so there are many resources. And so the two, if I assume most of our membership is kind of in this greater Seattle area, um, if you Google King County's, I'd write this down too, because I always forget it. But if you Google like King County solid waste, what do I do with? They have this great online resource where you literally it's a like a Google bar and you put in what do I do with CFL light bulbs uh, which are the kind of circular ones like this um, that are energy efficient but do contain some things like mercury so there's an environmental trade-off there and so they need to be disposed of properly so King County does a good job of um, describing which transfer station or where you can properly dispose of a variety of different things City of Seattle has a similar tool so you can just Google both those things City of Seattle uh, proper waste disposal or King County's, um, I think it's called, what do I do with tool? And disposing of things properly is super important. You might think, you know, well, nobody's going to notice if I just, you know, quick toss this in here. It actually makes a difference. This goes to something that I instill in my students a lot. I think one of the challenges with the environmental movement in general is, is the idea that individual changes don't have an impact, right? Like the problem is so big that if I do this one little thing, it's not going to matter. Uh, it actually does matter. And, and that's why it's important. That's why I do so much education because I want to empower people to understand that it actually does matter. So throwing away that paint and not disposing of it properly actually does make a difference. So, uh, so to your point, Joey, there are lots of great tools, particularly when we live uh, in a place that we do that has a really high support 
Um, you don't have to drive really far. Uh, most of the disposal things are free. Some of them, there's a minimal cost. Um, but I think it's important to, to get rid of things properly. So, so I'm glad you brought that up. Sure, it was a great question. It was something we wanted to, to discuss today and, and one of our Q&A sure. popped up and it was very similar. So I'm happy we were able to, to get that answered. Um, you know, at, at some point, many of us are, are gonna be transitioning back into, uh, you know, the work office environment. And, you know, th this, is, yep. this is constantly evolving. Um, if, if someone is nervous or anxious, uh, what sort of self-care or, or stress management strategies do you su suggest to, to help in the interim? Yeah, I think that's a really um, important point to think through, and I appreciate you raising that because we are going to go back to work at some point. It's not going to look the same, and it's not going to feel the same. And you're right; we don't know um, we don't know what it's going to look like. So whenever there's an unknown, that's that's scary, and there's anxiety involved. And so one thing that I direct people to is uh, it's actually two things. So um, Headspace is a meditation app that has, that I use, it has, and they, there are others, uh, but that's one that I use, and they have released some of their med guided meditations for free, exactly for this purpose, because people are suffering from a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress uh, and isolation right now, and so I always send people there, um, you know, it's just one of those subscription things that you can buy a subscription, but there's a couple things that you can do for free, so that's, that's a cool way to kind of get some support. Um, and then I think the other thing is to ask questions. You know, people are going to have a lot of questions for their employers. I guess the thing that I would say is that I think we all need to understand that we don't have the answers right now. So asking questions is important, but also knowing that you know, we don't know what it's going to look like to go back yet. We don't have, you know, I do, I was on an hour and a half webinar this morning um, with respect to kind of what these issues look like and, and we're working through them, but I think an understanding from the community that we don't exactly know what's what's going to be best yet um, is helpful when we're asking those questions. But always being an advocate for yourself is is super important. So we are at the top of the hour. Um, I just wanted to give you uh, an additional oh, yeah. opportunity to <laughs> give any uh, you know words of wisdom or some final advice uh, you might have uh, for everybody tuning in today. Oh, words of wisdom. Um, I mean, I think. I've highlighted a couple themes that are that are important and I think just recognizing that you spend 90% that's a conservative estimate as Americans of your time indoors and so being mindful of that space and its impacts on your health and wellness because they are significant uh, will totally shift your framework and you know the the scary way to also look at that is obviously take your age multiply it by 0.9 that's the number of years you've spent indoors if you really want to hammer that point home and um, so being mindful of what you bring into those spaces how much waste we create uh, is really important and also taking advantage of all the free resources out there um, like I mentioned earlier Joey took our free courses uh, my company develops classes uh, some of them are free some of them are paid but we have a couple on working from home they're helpful other companies do as well and um, I think the the final point is be an advocate for yourself you know Unfortunately, the law in our country doesn't support this, but I think it's true that you have a right to know what goes in and on your body, and that includes the things that are in your space because they ultimately touch you. There's a researcher that has this idea that we eat our buildings. What she means by that is every surface you touch, you get something on your hands. You touch, now we know how much we touch our faces. Uh, you touch food preparation spaces. You really are a part of the spaces that you exist in. And so getting, being an advocate for yourself, whether you're a renter, whether you work in an office building, um, as to and asking questions about your space, I think is um, is important. And so I, I always encourage people to do that and get more information. I've talked about a lot of free resources here. There are many more um, and, and use those and, and ask questions. It's my sage wisdom. And we'll make sure that we post your information as well um, uh, on our sites cool. um, where you'll be able to locate this video uh, for future referencing um, if you'd like. Uh, so on behalf of GSBA, we would like to go ahead and thank everybody for joining us today. A um, special thank you to you, Nicole, uh, for sharing these healthy working from home strategies. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize, you know, the privilege it is for working from home during COVID-19. And, and on behalf of GSBA, uh, thank you all for all of our essential workers who are out there on, on the front lines, you know, helping to keep our society moving forward. Um,
GSBA members, if you have uh, any follow-up questions or if we missed one of your questions by chance, um, feel free to reach out to our team. Um, we are more than happy to assist to get that answer for you. Um, you can also visit our GSBA uh, online directory um, and find out uh, additional members who are there to be able to, to connect with. Um, this directory features hundreds of businesses that support uh, equality for all. 